All right. Welcome to another episode of The Mess in the Middle. Today, my special guest is Chris. Now, Chris is going to go into some special things about not only his past, but what he's working on today. And I think you're going to get a lot of value out of some of the ideas and concepts that we've briefly talked about. So grab a coffee or a wine, depending on what time of day you're listening to this, and let's dig in. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Yeah, Otter, thanks for having me. Excited to do this with you. Yeah. So let's take a few minutes. I want you to talk a little bit about where you're at right now. Just like where are you in your journey and how are you showing up in the universe? 51, financial services entrepreneur based in Denver, Colorado. And so I have built a business the last 24 years helping People have a better relationship with money. Okay. Have, uh, 17 offices open, 200 agents. We've helped about close to 20,000 people. Beautiful. So, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah that's, so that's you know who my focus. audience is. Yeah, for yeah. sure. You probably absolutely. serve them daily. Yeah, absolutely. Love entrepreneurs. So one of the things that Chris has not told you yet is he's recently published a book. And, or I don't know how recent it was, but I know you're out promoting the book right now and sharing the value that's in it. There's a couple of topics in there that we've pre-discussed that we want to share with you guys, because we know that the value of what they can bring, especially if you're stuck right now in the middle of one of these two topics, that this conversation can definitely help. So I'll let Chris step in now and kind of share a little bit about that. In my book, I got just different concepts of how I got stuck and we as humans get stuck and it's okay to get stuck. It's just not okay to stay there. Perfect. And, right. and one of the, one of the areas that I didn't realize I had a problem with was approval addiction. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. Uh, I don't think I on. have. I try to think back because I do have a degree in psychology, but nothing Of course, just based on the words, I know what it means. I'm addicted to getting approval from others, but I'll be interested to hear how you explain it. Yeah, our beliefs are generated when we're children. The two topics we're going to talk about today, that's where it's really grounded. Uh, But to, to get what we want, we have to get the approval of our parents, of our teachers, coaches, and we get rewarded for we do good. We get their approval. We get the car, we get the money, we get the trophies, we get whatever. And approval addiction works until you choose a path that's not with the herd. And oh, interesting. So, okay. So if you want to be an athlete, an artist, an entrepreneur, anything that kind of goes against the grain, then what happens is the people in your life, in the name of love, so to speak, they like that. Yeah. yeah they want to they rescue you. And it's the old analogy everyone's heard of, the, the lobster that's crawling out of the bucket. And the masses want to pull you back. And one, one of my mentors that actually helped me write my book, he interviewed 25,000 entrepreneurs, salespeople, direct sales, that had all started a business and they ended up quitting. Wow. And, and he asked, yeah, 25,000 people. And he asked him, do you have an addiction to the approval of other people. And, Interesting. And less than 0.1% said they did. But we're all approval addicts at some level. We all right. want to get we all want to get affirmed by people, right? Sure. We want to be told that we're doing a good job or what we do is valuable or our, our lives don't work unless we have great relationships. So we we want affirmation. We need affirmation it's preferred but when we cross the line of it going from a preference to a need that's when we get into danger okay so let me unpack a little bit of that out of the percentage why do you think so many people are not aware of it i have no idea i don't they just don't know it's a subconscious thing it's uh, it's kind of like asking a fish what's water a fish is i don't know what water you just don't know and okay. what his studies showed, Audra, was they would do brain scans of people that were, one brain scan was someone that had a heroin addiction, and the other scan was the scan of someone that was in full-blown approval addiction mode. And the brain scans look identical. Wow. So it must have something to do with dopamine or Absolutely. some kind of, okay, yeah. kick in from that. 
Okay, so where it just unconsciously evolves with us generation after generation. Now, how does it become a problem? Yeah, so my personal story, I never really got dad's approval. Okay. Okay, and a lot of people don't get approval of their parents. And and when we as humans develop this at some point less than not good enough not this not that i talk a lot about beating ourselves up if we have time mm -hmm. how to really shift that my whole thing was i have this less than thought this less than mentality and it, it served me in high school in athletics I, I was an average athlete but i busted my tail to work really hard to create success which was good. I always say things serve you until they don't serve you. And there's a slippery slope there. And I was addicted to getting approval of other people. And when I left my safe corporate career behind as a CPA, and I started launching into my financial services entrepreneurial business, and my friends and my loved ones, and they're like, that's stupid. You're dumb. What you're doing is dumb. You're ruining your life. You're this, you're that. I was not getting their approval and it was painful. I bet. And it hurts. And what happens is that can take you out of the game if mm -hmm. you really don't know what it is you want and why you want it. And most entrepreneurs, they're just busy. They don't know really what they want and why they want it. They don't really have the clarity of aim that is necessary so that when you're in that moment of criticism or whatever it is, approval addiction, if you don't have a way to shift your mind to focusing on what you want, it can totally take you out of the game. So I took it and I was like, I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to prove people wrong. And so as painful as it was, that became the juice because most people's entrepreneurial vehicle they're in, I like to think it's a Ferrari, but if there's no gas in the tank of the Ferrari, it's not going anywhere. Sure. And so if you don't have the juice and your reasons, and when you're getting attacked, it didn't work. The other thing I did is, and this served me very well because it was very unpopular what I was doing going against the grain. And I felt like probably most of your listeners, like everyone's against you. The world's against you. Oh. Uh, I made the connection that if you weren't ultimately where I wanted to be, if you weren't living the life that I wanted to have, I just didn't listen to you. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. If you weren't living the results that I wanted to live, then why am I listening to you? Because everyone's got an opinion. And they'll say the most ridiculous things. And so if you can take it in, but you don't, you can listen to it, but you don't need to take it in. And people aren't usually burned out from their business. They're usually drained out by the drainers in their life. It's usually not the work. Go yeah. Ahead. I was going to say, I had experience like that my first couple of businesses. And what I had to get to was a place where... It wasn't about what they thought about it or didn't find out about it. I had to look at like, why are they coming at me with that kind of information? And what I disseminated from that is that's their fears. That's yeah. their self-doubt. That's their inability to take risks or have courage to be an entrepreneur. And once I was able to recognize, look, they're just, they're doing the best they can with what they got and they're just loving me. But that's not the best influence for me because we're not the same. I am a more of a risk taker. I do have more confidence in myself. If I put the work in, I know I'm going to achieve what I set my heart to. But others that I know are people that want jobs, that need that security and that safety net and that they don't have to make decisions like that. And once I separated that, then it was easy. Then I'm more than happy to take it but their input only goes so far. <laughs> yeah. And then I say, okay, this doesn't serve me, like you just said, and I appreciate your concern, but I still am going to go do what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. Most people don't 
no. do that. Like they, it took they, a minute. They, Don't get me yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah, anyway, but so that had a double edged sword to it because I wanted to prove to others that I was successful. So what it caused me to do was to have the home and the car that I couldn't afford, that I needed to pick up the bar tab. And I didn't realize how approval addiction was ruining me financially. Yeah. Didn't help with my first marriage. It didn't last very long because she was all about appearances and I bought into it. I was divorced and in $250,000 of credit oh. card debt because of that. And I signed an office lease that was too big because mm. I wanted to look like I had a big office, 6,000 square feet. And it, so it was in the great recession and I'm bleeding oh, three, four thousand, three, 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 four thousand negative cash flow every month. I had a mortgage. I had the office lease and I was paying my ex-wife $5,200 a month in alimony and child support. So this approval addiction is real. <laughs> it's no <and> joke. <laughs> it's no joke. And then my second current and last wife, if she's listening, Marlo, she walked into a disaster and we wrote a book 12 years ago called Couples Money that was talks about how we unraveled the disaster and, nice. and thrived. But I didn't know that I was having these challenges, but I had a coach that was like, based on results, how's your way working? It's one of the best questions of what's called objective reality. Which yeah. Is the, Wait, say that again. I want to hear it again. Based on results, how's your way working? Yeah, that's beautiful. You guys Man. listen to that and let it resonate for a second. I just want to interrupt with just one second sure. because that's so powerful. We become entrepreneurs because we want to be our own boss. But what we have to remember is if you were in a job and you were the top, say you were the VP of whatever your industry is, and you make a move to come over from being at the top to being an entrepreneur, you're actually starting down here, not in expertise, but in how to run a business. You have got to be open-minded enough and humble enough and okay enough in your own skin to learn from other people's mistakes. The entrepreneur path has been laid for hundreds of years, probably by now, hundreds of thousands of millions of businesses. It's all there for us. So slow down long enough, check your ego, because this isn't about ego, and learn how to take advice from others that have gone this path. If you're struggling, you got to stop. Am I struggling with approval? Am I chasing the wrong things? Am I looking for people that are just there to give me some kind of dopamine hit, but don't actually turn into transactions? Look at all of that and assess where you're at. The sooner you can get in and assess the situation, the sooner you can make changes. If you just stay oblivious to it, you, we're going to have this conversation if you're fortunate enough to last next year because you haven't worked through your stuff. So business is no different. So dig in and get started doing this work if this is an issue for you, which clearly, you know, based on that gentleman's study of 25,000 people, it's bigger than we think it is. So just be open to the idea is all I'm saying. Well, hey, go. Yeah, no, it's massive. The number one skill of a world-class performer is what's called objective reality. And it's the capacity to look at your results and own your results without taking yourself down emotionally. Good. That's it. And That's so, good. and our number one thing that we have to do as people, as entrepreneurs is not be delusional. And one of my favorite quotes is optimism and delusion sleep in the same bed together. So all this is going on, Audra, it's a financial crap show. And I'm like, how are you, Chris? It's awesome. Things are great. This is such a delusional. Yeah. And then I worked with a world-class coach for four and a half years. It just put a mirror in front of me and he's like, dude, it's not good. You got to own it. You created the mess. You put yourself here. But so I... I humbled down and we have to humble down because your, yeah. your, your ego is not your amigo and mm -hmm. it wants you to stay stuck right where you are. Right. And so I knew I had to grow. I had to change. I had to develop. I did not yet know approval addiction was a challenge. So I, I was at a, a 10 day seminar, all guys, worst and best 10 days of my life. I bet. And the worst part was I wasn't getting anyone's approval. Huh? So yeah. 
hand of God moment. Hey, let's put Chris in an environment for 10 days where nobody knows who he is. Because I was leading some people. I had a little bit of success, even though the financial stuff wasn't happening. So I had a high opinion of myself. And I go to a place where nobody knows me. And I'm not getting the dopamine hits of everyone's <laughs> approval. And I don't, and Audra, I don't know what is going on, but I just don't feel good. And we did a 48 hour like construction project, service project for this down and out elementary school in town. And we just worked 48 hours straight, hundred guys and nice. did some huge things. And then at the end of it, we all lined up and we walked past each other and we looked each other in the eye and we just did the silent acknowledgement. It was really super cool. And it was right there that I was like, oh my God, I never got dad's approval. And I've been running around like a chicken with his head cut off, like the Tasmanian devil trying to get everyone's approval. And, wow. and it just, it was ginormous. And so we, we got to sleep for a few hours. Then we did a lineup and this world-class facilitator. It's one of the greatest questions I've ever asked in my life. Comes up on my right shoulder. He said, what are you learning? I'm like, I have a tremendous need for the approval of other people. And he said, it's exhausting to watch you run around here trying to get everyone's approval. And then he yeah. asked me this question, Audra, who pays the price for that? Just you. The, oh, no. Ginormous yeah. price. My first marriage. Oh, like I see. My, ki saying. my kids who were little boy, two little boys in Atlanta, I'm in Colorado. I couldn't see them because I'm broke. My wife, my clients, my, because when you have an approval addiction need, you don't want to have tough conversations with people that need to have, that, that need to have, that you need to have them with my agents. So you just tell people, hey, you're, everything's good. You're so good. It's all good. Sometimes you got to be the bad a, guy. Yeah. You got to know when to hug and know when to kick. And anyway, and so I was like, OMG, it's huge. Wow. It was transformational. I wish I had the numbers I could show people, but when I became aware of it, and so what I want to say about it is we're all approval addicts and we all want approval and it works until it doesn't work. And it's not about getting rid of it. You'll never get rid of it. It's just, you have to understand when it causes you to not move forward, it, when it comes so you, you got to, everything I coach on is, okay, here's the awareness of the pattern that doesn't work. When it starts going, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole of self-sabotaging behavior, which approval addiction mm -hmm. is self-sabotaging. Sure. I want to have a shift and then do something different and it's transformational. And it still comes up for me, like even in my book launch and all the stuff I've been having to do. I haven't been getting everyone's approval. And oh my, pro my goodness. My, right. My approval addiction comes up. Like, oh my God, they don't like it. They don't like you. They don't like what. And it's just fun. Now it's, now it's a little more funny to me because I don't get sucked down that rabbit hole. I just say, okay, thanks for weighing in old friend. Not today. Shift. Because if I'm going to make the biggest impact, I'm going to have to put myself in position where people don't approve of me. And anyway, so we could probably talk hours on this topic because it is a big one. And most people do not know that it's an issue. You know what I like the, about what you just said is how you've got to go th through that. And until you actually experience the downside of that, if you wouldn't have had the financial issues or the divorce or the repercussion from that, that could have gone on for you for years oh. without ever changing. So if you're a small Oops. business owner and you're struggling, sit down for a second and just assess where you're at. Do you fit into any of these traits that could be slowing you down and tripping you up from getting to what's next? Anytime a problem creeps up in our business, first we have to recognize there's a problem and then we start working on solutions. That's always going to happen. That's got to become second skin for you as a business owner. If it's financial, if it's personal, if it's your mindset, if it's your staff, if it's your products or your customer service, these things are going to come up. They don't never go away. I don't care if you have a million dollars or $10, these things happen. 
But the goal is to always be conscious of, is there something else going on here that I need to pay attention to, to work through a solution so it doesn't get to a place where you have to hit the bottom for you to do change. It's, it sucks. You've got so many other moving pieces as well going on to add that to it. It's like I was trying to find clients and I was trying to service them and launch a new product, but I'm stuck with this approval addiction. And it shows up in the way I serve with my family, with my friends, my interaction on social media. When you were going through this, was social media a thing yet or not yet? No. No. no okay. No. Uh -uh. No, but, but. You know, how it wrecked my first marriage, especially mm. if you're a brand new entrepreneur, it was like, okay, I, I got to make this business work. And it was kind of like, okay, I got the approval of my wife. And it was kind of like, okay, mm. you, you wait there. Hold on. I'll be back. I got your approval. So that's good. I need to go get everyone else's approval. And once I have everyone else's approval, then I'll pay more attention to you. But it's very true. I wasn't just. That's not just me. It's, it's often fed, never satisfied. It's a bottomless pit and people are hearing this maybe for the first time, but just take it in and just watch the action step is, okay, this thing is real. What is causing me to hold back? Cause like I had some pain in the butt clients. Audrey, have you ever had any pain in the butt clients? Never. Too many. I had scarcity issues, had money issues. I know we're going to talk about that, but. I wasn't up front with them. I didn't want to lose them. I didn't want to get their disapproval. I didn't want them to tell people that I'm not this or that. It's ginormous when you sit back and just chew on it. Just ask yourself, you're like, something's holding me back because we all hold ourselves back. And is approval addiction holding me back? And the question for all humans that are living, yes, it is. It's so important. So you're right. So it's not, is it or isn't it? It's how much it is. Exactly. But how it's much? Okay. Approval addiction is cool and it works for you until it doesn't. What I mean by that is we want to love people and care for people and have great relationships and be loved and cared and respected and appreciated. It's just when it turns from a, I prefer that to happen, Audra, versus I need that to happen. Right. I prefer your approval, but I don't need it. So let's pivot a little bit. So we know that we've got this approval addiction that's going on. How big, how much we need to manage it or redirect it is one thing. Where does it show up? So you mentioned financially, you mentioned in relationships and customers. Let's go down the path of financially. I know if you're going through this messy middle, finances typically plays a part in this, either generating not enough revenue or trying to get to that next level, how does approval play into that situation? It, it, it totally ran me, right? So one is okay. just wanting to get everyone's approval that kind of told me it wasn't going to work. Okay. I, it caused me to overspend to look more successful than I really was. It caused me to also, and it wasn't always big things with me. It was I was losing the money game, small dollars at a time, especially as a business owner. I need to take my client out for lunch and I need to buy their lunch. Yeah, sure. You should do that. And, oh, it's a business expense. Okay. So I'm going to spend a dollar to save 30 cents, right? And I had to take them to great restaurants to make it look like I was successful and let's have great. Now my clients could care less. I'm like, let's have right. a coffee. And I'm like, fine. They'd rather do that and get on about their day. So overspending in your business, overspending in your office space, overspending with your car, uh, and medicating myself. For me, it, lots of cocktails, lots of happy hours, lots of, because I was broke, I was in fear, I was scared. So approval addiction was creating financial horrific things. So I was awesome at medicating myself with lots of cocktails and whatever your drug of choice is, and that's, that stuff's not cheap. And so it's huge. And then, yeah. and then just most people, unfortunately, Audra, have a horrific relationship with money. I know a lot of entrepreneurs, they're super smart, super successful, but they're broke. 
I know a lot of broke entrepreneurs and, and I was one of them. And it was because I had a bad relationship with money and money's a relationship, whether you like it or not. Sure. And you know how functional it is based on what's happening in your bank account and your balance sheet. So yeah. objective reality was me, $250,000 in credit card debt, negative monthly cash flow, no savings. I had a bad relationship with money. So what do you say to the people that are listening to this and say, no, but what I do, I'm a real estate agent. And if I showed up in a cheap car or not in a nice suit or not looking like I come from money, people are going to believe I'm not successful and I'm not qualified to provide them this service for this $2 million home. There is some where there is a little bit of, I don't know, game playing or role play in some people's businesses. What kind of advice would you give them? Yeah, I'm not opposed to that. If you see that as an investment in your business, but what, what, and unfortunately, I, I don't know very many successful, financially successful realtors. Okay. I know, <laughs> okay. I, I know a few, but most of them are hand to mouth. And I've talked to a lot of groups and if you're get, if you're hearing this and you're a realtor and you're like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's fine. I'm just telling you what my experience is. And a lot of people that are commission based don't have, and I was one of them. I got mm -hmm. it. I had a bad relationship with money. I was hand to mouth. And so it, it's not necessarily the suit or the car or whatever. Usually they're leaking and blowing money okay. elsewhere. And okay. they're losing the money game, five, 10, 15, 20 bucks at a time. And they're eating out constantly. And uh, it's a book, uh, T. Harv Eker wrote a book called The Secrets of a Millionaire Mind. One of my favorite. Yeah, the best book on your subconscious beliefs around money. Yeah. And unfortunately, when we're growing up, got your psychology background, we aren't programmed for financial success when we're right. kids. And then, Mass consciousness is wealthy people are bad people. There's and a lot of that. Still? Oh, yeah. Just wait for elections to come around. The, True. The, 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 I'm not going political with it, but yeah. oh, they don't pay their taxes. Whatever. They use tax planning. And uh, so you just pay attention to the messaging. And it's just, there. there's a lot that's coming at us on a subconscious level that we don't look at because of how we were raised. And this is actually, you and I were talking about Margaret Lynch. The biggest determining factor of your financial success is the vows that you made to gain acceptance into your family at a young age. Interesting. Okay. And she, she wrote a book called Tapping into Wealth, another phenomenal mandatory read, whether you do the exercises or not. And so when I was at that moment, and this is just, we're talking about money now. Okay. Yeah. So... I couldn't work any harder, Audra, and I knew the how-tos, but there was something beneath the surface that I had to shore up, and it was my money beliefs. And, and I worked with, yeah, and most entrepreneurs, not even most entrepreneurs, 96% of Americans retire broke. And it's not because they don't know what to do. They're not doing it. And what they're not doing is their, their belief doesn't, doesn't line up with being financially successful. You know, the numbers, 90% of lottery winners are dead, broke, or in jail inside of 10 years. Okay. People are like, they're dumb. No, they're not. Wait, dumb. why in jail? I don't know. Oh, that's is just that the true? studies. Yeah. 90% of lottery win win winners are dead, broke, or in jail inside of 10 years. Look at the athletes that get the hundred million plus contracts and then they're broke 10 years later. Yeah. So so I've met a few of them. <laughs> but it's not just them. It's just for the majority of the people in our country, we did not get programmed for financial success. Mm -hmm. So you can't just keep busting your tail and working. And then for me, it was like, I'm a coach who, my coach, I had hundreds of coaches that wanted to work with me. And I asked him like, are you financially independent? And they're like, no, I'm like, I've, I'm sorry. I'm sure you're a great coach, yeah. but that's not what I need. So finally, if that one, I said, coach, you finished independent. He's yeah, I've been finished independent for 40 years. Awesome. That's what I need. Mm -hmm. And so our first exercise, and he said, he said, you don't have a money problem. You have a money project. And the money okay. project, Chris, is we have to understand 
what you think about that topic. And, and this is a lot of stuff that I write about in my book is just understanding that there's you plus a thought equals a result. And so okay. most people have a result. And for me, I'd rather just be optimistic and delusional and not look at my result and not own it because it was my ex-wife's fault, it was the economy's fault, it was whatever my wife's fault, it's just easier to play victim more so than ever. But finally it was like, okay, I have to change. I need to quit living in hopium, which is where our most hopium. people are <laughs> hoping. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, hoping hopium. the outside world's gonna change while I insist on staying the same. But it was, okay, you're broke, you have challenges and people could be listening like, Chris, I'm not broke, got it. You don't have to be sick to get better. It's just, we could do a whole show on money thermostats and how much money we actually see ourselves making. And there's a lot of, it's all mindset, Audra. It's all mindset. Yeah. It's a hundred percent mindset, but there's the thought that there's the result, there's you, and then there's your thinking. And so I sat down with my money journal, my green money journal, and I wrote the word money at the top and I sat with it for an hour. Nice. And it was, what do I make up about this word? Okay. And it was hard to make. Oh. Yeah. Almost every entrepreneur has that one. Right. Yeah. Hard to make, hard to keep. My dad told me rich people suck. Oh. My mom said, you either have money or you don't. Like you really don't have a choice. But and I, sh I share all the, I share all my limiting beliefs in the book. But I wrote it all down and it was eye opening because literally I had eight to 10 limiting blue strand money been swirling around in my head for 37 years. It was 37 when I did that exercise. And what studies have shown is financially successful people, they had the same limiting beliefs too. But at some point, they called BS on it and they actually sat their butts down and did the hardest work on the planet, which is actually thinking and getting a real, an understanding of the thinking that's creating the result. And so when nice. I wrote that, when I wrote that down, I'm like, oh, Audra, I finally met the enemy, me, right? And it was obvious why I was broke. CPA financial advisor, how could you be broke? You know what to do. I wasn't doing it. So anyway, I shifted okay, so, to a better yeah, money was... story, to a money story. I rewrote okay. a better money story. Okay. And there's a million affirmations you could have, whatever. Some people think affirmations work. Some people don't. Either, either group is right. I think they work. And making and saving big money is easy. Money is the scorecard of value that I'm creating for others. So okay. I'm creating more value, making more money. If I'm not growing, my money's not growing, right? So if I'm growing, if I'm growing, my income should be growing. If I'm personally growing, and the only way we'll find true fulfillment in life is if we are personally growing and we're contributing to others. Those, that's the only place fulfillment lies. So if I'm growing, my income's growing. I attract success, abundance, and peace into my life because that is who I am. That was my go-to all time. I got a great story about that. But anyway, so that... That was it. And my coach said, hey, you're not going to shift it in 21 days, but you have to be conscious of it and you got to start shifting this story and it will work. And your life looks like a big black hourglass, big black sand hourglass right now. We just got to drop a little piece of gold in there every day, bud. And that is you affirming the right things, you keeping your word, whole another topic, keeping your word to yourself in and doing the work and doing the uncomfortable yeah. things and not letting approval addiction get the best of you. But if you could just drop a little piece of gold in that hourglass every single day, it's going to light up and it'll be mostly oh. gold and then it'll be all gold. And that was the image he gave me that actually gave me hope wow. that I could change it a little bit at a time. I could eat the elephant one bite at a time and, and we transformed. That's great. What a great story. So many people, when they start running into challenges in their business, they don't take the time to look in here. It's typically out here. The market's not right. The economy sucks. Nobody's spending money on this widget right now. My customers aren't willing to pay this price. I can't get it supplied at a decent rate. 
The customers will do the work if they're a coach that I ask them to do. So it's always some kind of outside reflection, which you touched on there. But nine times out of 10, it's not outside, it's internal. It's your own crap, your own stories, your own made up belief of who you are and where you're supposed to be in this life. And I've had quite a few podcasts about this. Mindset trips up everybody. And I don't care what stage of the business that you're in, it will become a challenge at some point through this process. You need to stay cognizant of it becoming a bigger issue. So you, one, you don't end up down the road as Chris did. Your, your mistakes serve many other people to prevent that. So the ones that have traveled before you that have taken the arrows, learn from their mistakes and sit down and look at it and say, my bank account's empty right now. My credit cards are maxed out. People are not buying. Instead of me saying somebody else put me in this situation, you got to take responsibility for it and say, you know what? I'm the business owner here. This is my responsibility. The good comes with the bad. You decided to be self-employed because you wanted to be in charge. When stuff like this comes up, you're in charge. Fix it. Dig in, get a coach, get some books. Chris just gave a couple of great recommendations. There's lots of books out there about money and getting back to the right place if that is an issue. But the more work that you can do on yourself and the more that you do that introspect to find out where you're showing up or not showing up, the quicker you'll recover and then you're able to move into the next things. One more tip on that. I run into a lot of people that the product, the service, the clients, the pricing, none of that is the issue. It's all up here. And it's the stories that the business owner is imprisoning themselves with. There's no point in it. Find the time to work through it. It is just as important as working in your business every day. So set aside an hour a week, set aside 30 minutes every morning, whatever that is, but it is important. And if you want your business to grow and scale, you're going to need to put the time in to you to make sure you can. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a hundred percent mindset. And I would challenge everybody that this topic of money, that's where I would go. Because what's going to happen is as you shore that up, it, in my book, I talk about deserving issues, OMG, that drives a ton of entrepreneurs. Do I deserve to be successful? It's a ridiculous man-made mind virus that doesn't exist, but I didn't even know because I'm like, okay, I want to be financially successful. I want to get clear. My wife and I set a a savings goal because most people can't save and I couldn't save. And that goal caused me to look at all sorts of stuff, but the goal became super emotional for what it meant. And we wanted financial relief and relief financially. When I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people want relief financially and you need to be able to identify the feeling tied to the financial goal. That's where Mm -hmm. everybody screws up is they think financial goals are logical. And they're not, you can make them logical, but it's not going to get you there. It's not going to get the gas in the Ferrari. You have to know the feeling you're looking for. And my wife and I stared at each other. I'm like, I want relief. I want relief like oxygen. It is a powerful driver for an entrepreneur. I want financial relief. And most well, of Well, isn't that it. why people start businesses to begin with? Yeah. No, they want time control. They want, they want to make an impact. They want to do all that. But the entrepreneurial dream can become an entrepreneurial nightmare if you don't have a good relationship with money and you don't understand it. So everyone that's listening, it's not going to be your social media strategy or sales or all that stuff's important. But if I say, what are the top three things that you think about money and you spout them off right now and it's either energy up or energy down, most Mm -hmm. people it's energy down. Because I've done the exercise for thousands of entrepreneurs. I write it on a whiteboard. Money. Go. I also do that with sales. Write the word sales down. What comes up for you? Audra, anytime I do that exercise, 95% of the time, that word, there's a negative response from the crowd. Oh, I so, they have a, so they have a bad relationship with word sales and they have a bad relationship with the word money. It's going to be tough. Your number one skill as a business <laughs> owner is the ability to sell. End of story. So those are 
beliefs and most people are looking for tactics on that stuff and it's not going to work. Your mindset has to shift on those two words if you're going to be a successful entrepreneur. So as we get close to wrapping up here, you covered two very important topics that if you're stuck in the middle, you really need to take the time and assess. Where would you tell somebody that thinks, you know what, this could be my problem. I need some help. Where do they start looking for the solution? I mean, for for a, a approval addiction. So in my book, I have a rec- recommendation for a course. It, it's an approval addiction course. Okay. That Steve Siebel put together that is unbelievable and b- based in a, a massive amount of research and uh, nice. real systematic ways to become aware of it. Money, I think what worked for me is just, and, and once again, understanding, hey, I don't have a approval addiction problem. I have a project. I don't have a money problem. I have a money project. First is what is your relationship with that word? And mm-hmm. there is a ton of books that you can grab on, but once again, you got to get after it. And so T. R. Becker's book is where I would start. Margaret Lynch's book, Tapping into Wealth. It, that stuff is, and there's a lot of resources. It's not money how-to things. It's money beliefs. It's money mindset stuff. Any book you can get on that okay. is going to serve you. Okay. Oh, How okay. Rich People Think. Sorry, my Lord. My mentor wrote a book called How, okay. How Rich People Think by Steve Siebel. Uh, okay. And that is all, that whole book is, hey, middle class thinks this way on money. The world class thinks this way. It is one by one, page by page going, okay, here's the limiting belief that most people have. Here's what the ultra successful and world class are people that are world class. They operate from love and abundance and service. They're not posting Fear their, and scarcity. They're not, and... they're not posting their Lambos on social media. It's not right. that's not who you want to be. Right. These are people that do well, help a crap load of people, give a lot of money away. These are the people that aren't in the limelight, but they are wildly successful, right. wildly wealthy, and they make a huge impact. Those are the people you need to study. Nice. Alrighty, you guys, this was another episode of The Mess in the Metal. Thank you, Chris, for being here. And I'll be sure to put all the links in the show notes so you guys can check out the books and the courses and all the things to get on the path. Worst case scenario, go to YouTube and just do a search on some of this stuff and find some podcasts or some videos to start you down on this path so you can figure out if this is what's got you stuck. So until next time, keep moving through the middle.